Well, a very warm word, word of welcome uh, to all who are gathered to this church building today to unite together in worshiping the Lord. Special word to those who are visiting among us. May the Lord unite all our hearts together to exalt his name and praise here today. And also for those who may join us over the internet, a very warm welcome. May you be blessed as we join together in worshiping the Lord. Begin our worship as we sing praise. We sing praise from Psalm number 65C. Psalm number 65C. From the 8th stanza down as far as the 12th stanza. The tune we're using is Heber number 219. We'll be thinking about the generosity of the Lord whom we come to worship. The generosity of the God whom we come to worship. And this psalm expresses his generosity to the, to the covenant land, the land of Israel under the old covenant. And there's lots of pictures here of the abundance, the overflowing abundance of his blessing upon the land as he blesses his people whom he brought into that land. Here are some of the words that stand out, uh, speaking of the generosity of the Lord's uh, blessing. Stanza nine, stanza nine. God's river brims with water. God's river brims with water. That means there's been a lot of rain and that was so much regarded. We don't maybe regard rain as, as much a blessing as we should. But in those dry lands and dry parts, what a blessing to have rivers brimming with water. Or, or yet again, uh, further down stands 11. There's a striking phrase. Thou crownest years with goodness. A crown of goodness upon, upon the land uh, throughout the year. And then even the last stanza, the last stanza, the fields with flocks are, are covered. There's lots of flocks. There's the, the, the grain is abundant. The grass is abundant. Uh, the Lord is blessing the land and therefore the flocks are also abundant. The fields with flocks are, are, are covered. And there's joy in the land. There's joy throughout the land. They all rejoice with shouting. They all with songs are glad. So this is a psalm celebrating the Lord's generosity and his great goodness to the land. And that's a picture, of course, of the abundant spiritual blessing he pours out into the lives of his people. We're blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. So may we sing this psalm in praise to the generosity of our gracious God. Psalm number 65c, from the 8th stanza to the 12th stanza, to the tune Heber number 219. Uh, if you're able to stand, please stand to sing praise and remain standing to pray. We thank you for the example here of the psalm where the people of Israel, your covenant people, were so filled with songs of joy, so joyful because you were blessing their land so generously, so graciously, so abundantly. You were making the crops to grow. You were providing plenty of rain 
There were flocks covering the fields. And so they were rejoicing in your generosity and in your goodness toward them. And Lord, even indeed in our own land, we can rejoice in that as well. That we have plenty of food to eat and that you're blessing this land with fertility and agricultural prosperity. And we can look forward again, O oh Lord, with expectation and confidence to another good year of harvest in due course. Lord, even much more so today, we, we want to express our joy and our gratitude to you for the abundant spiritual blessings that belong to all who trust and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we acknowledge that apart from him, we are in spiritual poverty. We're spiritually bankrupt and we have no good thing spiritually. But Lord, how we praise you when you open up our hearts to believe in the gospel and embrace Jesus Christ in saving faith, turning away from our sins. And when we put our faith in him, how richly blessed we are. Lord, help us today then to be filled with spiritual joy as we come to this place today to join together in worshipping you. We acknowledge, Lord, there are many things perhaps in our lives that could make us sad and sorrowful, that are a burden to us. But Lord, help us to look beyond them today. Help us to look beyond them to the, the, the joy that should be ours in Christ Jesus, the joy of your salvation. We praise you, Lord. We're blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in the heavenly realms. We praise that you've adopted us as your children and you've bestowed upon us all the rights and the privileges of the children of God. And we praise you, O Lord, in the expectation of that amazing, uh, 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 incomparable, heavenly blessing that awaits us, O Lord. For that heavenly hope, that sure heavenly hope, belongs to all who trust and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, indeed, help us to worship and adore you as our gracious and generous Lord and Saviour this day. Lord, we do pray too for those who can't come to the building today, belonging to this congregation, either because of ill health or weakness, or because they have caring duties and responsibilities. Lord, may they know your nearness to them today. May they experience your love in a special way uh, this day. We do return thanks to you, Lord, for your goodness to some who have suffered sickness and illness in recent days and whom you've restored in answer to prayer and are able to be among us today. And we thank you too, Lord, for those visitors you've brought among us. We pray now, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you'll unite all our hearts together to worship and glorify your name, to rejoice in the Saviour, Jesus Christ. For it is in Jesus' name we pray and all for his sake. Amen. Well, let's re read God's word now in our worship. And we do so, first of all, from 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Reading from the first verse down as far as the 11th verse. 1 Peter chapter 4. We begin the reading at verse 1. Let's hear the word of God. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God, in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he's received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, 
He should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides. That in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. We end our reading there at verse 11. Could I ask those children who'd like to come forward to the front to please come forward now to the front for the children's talk. That's what I wanted to show you, boys and girls. So here we go. Bring it down. Good to see you all up at the front. You're very welcome. Very welcome indeed. Now, I want to show you some things here. They're very delicate. I have to be careful I don't drop them and break them. Now, I wonder what these are. Do you know what these are? Anyone know? So, cup and a cup. Exactly. It's a, it's, milk. Exactly. It's a, a milk a jug, maybe we'd call it. Wouldn't we call it a milk jug? And we call this a, it's a sm- tiny, cute little cup, isn't it? tiny small cup I wonder do any of you the girls maybe anyway do any of you have uh, do you have um, you know toy tea sets T- toy do you have a toys tea set and you like to play with it maybe you like to take out the saucers and and the cups I have uh, a toy uh, that's part that's very important as well without a kitchen you couldn't you couldn't uh, look after people either you need the kitchen don't you and what you would do, of course, would be if you had a friend coming around, there might be, um, you'd have a teapot. I don't have a teapot with me. You'd pour the tea in, and then there'd be milk in the milk jug, and you'd pour it in the milk, and you'd offer it to the person who was visiting your house. You'd say, here's a cup of tea. And, or, well, you might put sugar on it as well. Some people would put sugar on it. But you'd offer, you'd offer your guest the, the cup of tea to welcome them into your house. Isn't that right? And the verse that I have in God's Word today talks about what's called, as a big word, but I'll explain what it means. It talks about offering hospitality. Now, hospitality, it says, 1 Peter, there it is up there, 4 verse 9, and you can see the teapot and the, uh, the, the spoon and the, the fork and the plate, etc. there, and it says, offer hospitality to one another. Hospitality, that's a big word, isn't it? Hospitality is a big word. Can I explain it, what it means? It means to, to welcome people into your home, uh, to give them even just a cup of water if they're thirsty, to give them a cup of tea and a biscuit, and sometimes to make a meal, or sometimes even to say, you're very welcome to stay at our house. Say somebody's visiting Limavady, and they need somewhere to stay, and your mummy and daddy would say, come on, come to our house. You're very welcome to stay at our house. We'll provide you with a bed, and we'll provide you with food while you're here, and we'll make you welcome. The Lord wants us to do this. Now, how could you make people welcome in your house? What simple thing could you do? Well, maybe if another boy and girl was coming along to your house, you would say, here's a nice seat for you to sit in. You could say that, couldn't you? Or here are some of my toys that you can play with. Sometimes boys and girls say, oh, I don't want anybody coming to my house to play with my toys. That wouldn't be good, would it? To keep all your toys to yourself and not share them. Hmm? It came. Good. That's a good example. He came to your house and you made him welcome. Good. Well, that's what offering... You had in your house. You had a cake in your house for somebody. Is that right, Leah? Yeah. Well, you, you welcome your house. You offer them uh, just even a very simple drink, or maybe a biscuit, and you say you're welcome. Sit here, and you talk to them, and you love them. That's what hospitality is all about. And God's word says to us that's something we should be doing, especially for people we don't know, for people we don't know, for strangers, as we'll see, but also for those whom we do know. So here's the verse I want you to take away today. Offer hospitality to one another. First Peter, it's found in First Peter chapter 4, and it's verse 9. And I have sheets for you here today. I brought the sheets along. You have them on the computer as well, I think. I brought them along for you to color in. There we are. And you can go back to your seats then when I give you a sheet. And thank you for coming forward. There we are. There we are. There we are. That's right, and there we are. Okay. (laughs) 
We're going to sing now a psalm of praise. That again, speaks of the Lord's generosity to the land. It's Psalm 147a. Psalm 147a. Stanzas 8 to the end. The tune is Aurelia, number 230. I want to draw our attention to one particular blessing here in stanza 9 that the Lord was pouring upon the land. He gives peace to your borders. That's a great blessing. But also this one, with finest wheat fills you. Maybe hearing in the news nowadays that because of the war in Ukraine, there could be a shortage of wheat in the world and some poor people will begin hungry and not be able to afford bread. We need to pray for again for blessing upon our world that the wheat throughout the world will grow well, that the Lord will bless this world with the finest wheat to nourish us. Here it says, he's blessing this land, the land of Israel, with finest wheat to fill them, the generosity of the covenant God. So Psalm 147a, stanzas 8, 13, the tune is Aurelia, number 230. Let's stand and sing praise to the Lord. You may be seated. We'll continue on now with our morning worship as present the morning tithes and offerings.
Well, our second reading today from God's Word is found in 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25, reading the first 11 verses. Reading the first 11 verses. Our theme today in the Word of God will be the offering of hospitality. And sometimes it's good to have a negative example that we're not to follow. And this passage in 1 Samuel chapter 25 certainly sets before us a negative example. The example of Nabal, whom we ought not to imitate. 1 Samuel 25, reading 1 to 11. Let's hear the word of God. Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him. And they buried him at his home in Ramah. Then David moved down into the desert of Maon. A certain man in Maon, who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband, a Calebite, was surly and mean in his dealings. While David was in the desert, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that the sheep shearing time, when your shepherds were with us, we did not ill treat them, and the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your servants and they will tell you. Therefore be favorable toward my young men, since we come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name. Then they waited. Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men coming from who knows where? So we end the reading there at verse 11 of this chapter. Well, in contrast to Nabal, who was so mean, we now sing of the man who is blessed because of his generosity. He's reflecting the character of the Lord his God. And he's a generous giver. Stanza 5 of Psalm 112b. Stanza 5. With open hand. He's open handed. With open hand he offers to the poor. Psalm 112b. We're singing all of this portion. The tune is Eventide number 274. Once more we'll stand to sing praise. We're able to stand and remain standing to join together in prayer.
us pray. Let us draw near to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Gracious and generous Lord, we've been praising you for your generosity. And now, Lord, we want to especially return thanks to you for the, the homes that you provide for us in this land. How comfortable they are, generally equipped with all the modern conveniences. How spacious they are and how securely we can live in them in this part of the world. Indeed, how big they are compared to some of the houses that our forefathers had to live in and how much bigger they are than the hovels where, which people have to live in in some other parts of the world, in parts of Africa and, and of Asia. Lord, we praise you, Lord, for these comfortable homes that you've given us to live in. And we pray, Lord, we'd never take that blessing for granted, but appreciate your generosity and your goodness to us in the homes that you've given to us. And we thank, Lord, of so many in our world, even this day, who are refugees, fleeing from war zones, living in tents, having had their houses and their homes destroyed and torn to the ground. How blessed we are in this land, O oh Lord. Be blessed with peace and security. We pray we may continue to enjoy that peace and security in this land for many years to come. We pray for your blessing upon the forthcoming elections that peace may be maintained in their aftermath and wise and generous and gracious rulers may be appointed over us. Lord God, we do pray for those in other lands, especially in the land of Ukraine, who's ha who've had their homes destroyed, who've had so much destroyed, all their possessions even taken away from them and had so many of them had to flee from other lands and be separated from their family members. We pray, Lord, for all those agencies especially Christian agencies who are seeking to show love and care and bring practical support to the people of Ukraine in these days. And Lord God, the sovereign Lord over all the nations of the world, we cry out to you to be pleased to cause this terrible war to stop and to cease. That Lord, in some way or another, you would stay the hand of the aggressor and peace might be restored once again to the land of the Ukraine. Lord, we thank you for indeed for the homes we have, but most of all, we thank you for that heavenly home that you prepared for all of your people, for all those who believe in you. We thank you, O Lord, that goodness and mercy do follow us all the days of our lives. In Christ Jesus, we can look forward to dwelling in your house forevermore in your presence. What a joyful hope that is. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to use the homes you've given us to us uh, to care for others, to show your love to others, that you'd help us indeed, Lord, to respond well to the truth from your word that we're thinking about this morning, to offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. It is in Jesus' name we ask all these things and all for his glory. Amen. And you may be seated. Uh, please turn back with me now to the first passage you read in 1 Peter chapter 4, especially verse 9. 1 Peter 4 and verse 9 is our main text today. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Our theme this morning in this series of messages on the one another's of the New Testament is to offer hospitality to one another. To offer hospitality to one another. And let me begin by sharing an extract with you from a document that I make use of when I teach early church history at the Reformed Theological College. It's a letter with a name that is difficult to pronounce and difficult to remember but it has been described as one of the most beautiful letters of the early New Testament church. It is called the letter to Diognetus. The letter to Diognetus, so that, see it's not easy to pronounce it, probably composed in the late second century, or perhaps the early third century. And in this letter, the anonymous author, we don't know his name, but he was a Christian, was trying to get across to a man called Diognetus how the Christians were living such godly and attractive lives through the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And amongst other things, this writer commends these early Christians in the following way. This is how he writes of them. And there is something extraordinary about their lives. Any country can be their homeland. But for them, their homeland, wherever it may be, is a foreign country. They marry and have children, but they do not expose them. They share their meals, but not their wives. They share their meals, but not their wives. Notice how the writer claimed these early Christians were living extraordinary lives. Not merely because they were avoiding adultery, sharing their wives. But also because they were excelling in the grace of hospitality. It was so noticeable that they were sharing their homes and their meals with one another. I've just used that second century example as an opening illustration of how offering hospitality to another should mark our Christian living. It should mark our Christian living. I know it does mark the Christian living of so many of you gathered here today, if not indeed all of you. Of course, we don't need to just rely on the testimony of church history to establish the importance of hospitality in the life of Christians. First and foremost, we should be convinced of this and we should be practicing it because of what the word of God tells us about it. And hence, let's pay particular attention this morning to these words of 1 Peter 4 and verse 9. 1 Peter 4 and verse 9, where God's word says to us, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. I want us to think about three things concerning this offering of hospitality to one another. First of all, it's important that we understand the meaning of hospitality, the scope of hospitality, the meaning or the, and the scope of hospitality. Nowadays, as you may know, the word is used, the word hospitality is used most often in regard to what's called the hospitality industry. Uh, that's the restaurants and the, uh, the hotels and, and the guest houses, whereby accommodation and meals are provided, but they're provided to paying guests, aren't they? If you go along to an hotel or a guest house, yes, you'll get a bed and you'll get a good meal, I'm sure, but you'll have to pay for it. You'll have to pay for it. Clearly something very different is in view here in 1 Peter 4 and verse 9. Accommodation and meals may be offered, but this is not done in order to make a profit or to earn a living. To understand what is involved in the distinctive practice of Christian hospitality, let me draw your attention for a moment to the literal meaning of the Greek word used here in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 9. The literal meaning of the Greek word here, it means literally exactly love of the stranger. Love of the stranger. It's interesting the word love comes in because of course in the previous verse it says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. And now offer love to the stranger to one another without grumbling. And uh, actually that word, that Greek word, is the very opposite in meaning to another Greek word that, is, that is actually, we actually use in the English language. The word xenophobia. Xeno, you know what xenophobia is? Well, xenophobia means fear or loathing or suspicion of the stranger. Fear or loathing or suspicion of the stranger. And that's not an uncommon thing in our fallen world. The sin of xenophobia. Many a stranger far away from home can get treated with undue, unfair hostility or suspicion when she or he arrives in a foreign land or a town or a city that isn't their hometown or city. But the Greek word used here in 1 Peter verse 9, which is actually, if you want the Greek word, it's philo xenos, philo meaning love, xenos meaning stranger. It, it's the very opposite. It conveys the idea of a loving welcome being extended to a stranger and of practical care being given to him. 
and particularly in view here, of course, our fellow Christians who are strangers to us. And this was of special importance, of special importance in the early centuries of the New Testament church. For the inns and the hotels in those days were very often dirty. They were very often dangerous and they were quite expensive for people to afford. And very often they were also dens of immorality and iniquity. Even a much later stage than that, if you've ever watched uh, Les Miserables, you may remember the innkeepers, the Thenardiers. What an awful place they ran. It was a den of immorality, a den, a dirty, dangerous, immoral place. Earlier on here in these early centuries, inns were certainly like that. So all the more important, therefore, that travelling believers and especially travelling Christian evangelists who were going here, there and everywhere bringing the good news of the gospel, that they should be welcomed by their fellow believers into their homes who provide them with bed and with board. Apparently this could be extended not just for a night or two, but even over a period of weeks and months while these travelling evangelists worked in the vicinity. Love of the stranger. Maybe your mind might turn to this point to a marvellous example of this in the New Testament. It was set by a man named Gaius. He's mentioned in the third epistle of John, verses 5 to 8. And here's how the elder commended him for his hospitable behaviour toward the travelling evangelists who were strangers to him. The elder writes in third John 5 to 8, Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your, your love. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such men so we may work together for the truth. So we see here how Gaius has been praised for showing such loving hospitality to Christians who had been strangers to him. And he's been encouraged to keep on doing that for in that way he can be a fellow worker with them for the cause of the truth of the gospel. Gaius is therefore an outstanding illustration of how Christian hospitality involves the extension of love to strangers. <coughs> And you'll recognize as well, I'm sure, it stands out in stark contrast to the behavior of that man, Nabal. Remember what we read about him in 1 Samuel chapter 25? He was a rich man. He wasn't lacking anything. He had lots of flocks. He was doing very well for himself. But he was mean. He was a mean man. How did Nabal treat David and his men when they needed supplies? One would have to say he treated them with meanness and, uh, and rudeness as if he said to them, sling your hook away with you. Good for ask ourselves this morning, which of these two do you most resemble? Are you more like Gaius, Gaius? Or are you, I hope not, are you more like Nabal? If, I've, as we've seen, this love of strangers at the heart of Christian hospitality, how then should it work itself out in our circumstances, in our lives nowadays? How should it work itself out? Well, occasionally, we do get, don't we, visiting preachers. That can provide an opportunity for at least some of us to offer hospitality to the servants of the Lord. And some of these visiting preachers may be quite unknown to you. You may know their name but you may not know much about them. It'll be an opportunity to get to know them whenever visiting preachers come. And if in the providence of God, and in due course this will happen, in, in the providence of God, your minister was to be no longer, you were no longer a premier minister, you'd have plenty of opportunities to welcome visiting preachers here and to show them hospitality. Then again, while we don't get that many visitors perhaps to our Services and Mabadi isn't this congregation Mabadi isn't at the centre of the world. Uh, we're, we're in a bit of a backwater. We're not on the main roads. We don't get that many visitors, but we do get visitors. We do get visitors from time to time, especially in the summertime. There are even visitors among us today. It would be a great pity if any of those visitors were to head away without being offered some hospitality in our homes. Now, most of these visitors will find probably have plans in place already for their lunch or for their dinner. 
But it would be sad, it would be sad if any of them should ever have away with the impression that congregation of Amavati isn't a very hospitable one. I don't think it's like that, but may it never become like that. And occasionally as well, uh, we do have students, don't we, arriving in town. Not too many students, not as many as in Belfast or in Galway or the big cities. But we do get some students from time to time arriving in town. And it would certainly be good for them to know that they're welcome at our homes and at our tables. Let me share a personal memory with you. I remember with great, great gratitude uh, during my time as a theological student in Belfast, when I was welcomed again and again, nearly every week, if I'd wanted to go every week, I could have. I was welcomed again and again into one particular home belonging to a family in our Shaftesbury Square congregation. How well they looked after and cared for that poor country lad who could hardly cook in the midst of a great city. I really appreciated it. And maybe as well, we could even ask this. Could there still be some members of this congregation who, as it were, are still relative strangers to you? Could that be the case? Could that be the case? Those whom you don't know that well at all. And you might have little or no idea of what's actually going on in their lives. Can we really get to know each other very well via brief and occasional conversations on Sunday mornings or after midweek meetings? Surely spending several hours in our homes together, even over a coffee, will help to ensure that we're not strangers to one another. And in the church community, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, we certainly should not be strangers to one another. Think of what is said about those disciples at the very outset of the New Testament era in Acts chapter 2 and verse 46. This was said of them. They broke bread, and the breaking of bread in this instance is not the Lord's Supper. It refers to eating meals together. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Or indeed, might there be some in this congregation who spend, have to spend a lot of time on their own and who'd really appreciate a welcome into your home to experience the warmth of your Christian friendship in a much deeper way than they have to date. So while the Greek word here tells us the offering of hospitality involves mainly the expression of love to strangers, it definitely doesn't exclude us opening up our homes to members of our own congregation. But on the other hand, look at it the other way, let's ensure that our hospitality is not confined to our best and closest friends and rarely or ever extended to strangers. For if we only ever offer hospitality to our friends, what are we doing more than others? Non-Christians are usually quite happy to have their friends around for a party in their house. What great big party. But you see, Christian hospitality should be far wider and broader in its scope than that. May you then excel in love for the stranger as you open your homes to him or her. Let's move on from the meaning and the scope of hospitality. Let's now consider the duty of hospitality. The duty of hospitality. That is to say that God's word does not present us here with the offering of hospitality as some kind of optional extra. It actually lays it down as a command or an exhortation. Offer hospitality to one another, it says. Actually, in regard to elders, this is an essential qualification for office. If you turn sometime to Titus chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, it tells us an overseer must be hospitable. An overseer must be hospitable. Here's a reminder to all of us who are elders, an opportunity for us to reflect upon how welcoming our homes are to the members of the flock under our care and to others who may come our way. And when in due course this congregation is called upon to choose and elect new elders, here's one thing you should be thinking about or considering in regard to any potential elder. How hospitable is he? How hospitable is his home? Would you get a welcome there? 
However, as is clear here from 1 Peter 4 verse 9, the duty of hospitality applies to all believers, not just to the elders or to the overseers. And alongside this general command in 1 Peter 4, there are two other places in the New Testament where this duty to be hospitable is definitely addressed to every believer. I want us to turn to them for a little while because they do cast further light on this duty. First of all, if you were to turn to Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews 13, verses 1 and 2. Listen to these words. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Well, we'll we'll mention the angels later on. A very unusual and remarkable statement there. But for the time being, I want you to focus on this little phrase in Hebrews 13. Do not forget to entertain strangers. Don't forget it. The implication of that statement is surely this. We might be in danger of forgetting about or overlooking this important aspect of Christian ministry. It's perhaps not that we'd ever sit down and say, I am not going to offer hospitality. But we might simply in the busyness and cares of our lives, we might just, it might just suffer by neglect. So make sure you do not become forgetful or neglectful of your Christian duty in this regard. And if you have become forgetful of it, here's a timely reminder from the word of God that you're to be an offerer (laughs) of hospitality. For the other New Testament command regarding the duty of hospitality, you turn to Romans chapter 12 and verse 13. Romans 12 verse 13. The New International Version translates this as practice hospitality. The King James Version renders it as given to hospitality. Perhaps the best translation which really conveys the intensity of this command is pursue hospitality. Pursue hospitality, run after it, chase after opportunities to offer hospitality. Don't wait to be asked by the elders or the catering committee. Be ready to take the initiative. Be at the ready to serve others in this way. Far from being reluctant to engage in the offer of hospitality, be at the ready, looking out to do it. To be nothing less than a pursuer of hospitality is a duty set before us in Romans 12 and verse 13. So these three passages, our main text, 1 Peter 4 verse 9, Hebrews chapter 13 verses 1 and 2, Romans 12 verse 13, they all call upon us to be dutiful in the offering of hospitality. A few words perhaps of qualification here. This is not meant here. The word of God is not meant here to impose an unfair burden of guilt upon anyone listening into this sermon today whose circumstances make it impossible for them to offer much hospitality. Where there is ill health in the home, and that's all too prevalent, or a heavy weight of caring for family member, it would be unreasonable to expect the widespread practice of hospitality in such circumstances. And we know only too well, don't we, how the exceptional circumstance of the pandemic severely, actually severely restricted opportunities to offer hospitality. Thankfully, those days are passing. But on the other hand, why we shouldn't we shouldn't make unreasonable demands or have unreasonable expectations. On the other hand, can't we? Can't we? Let's be honest with ourselves. Can't we all, all be very good at coming up with excuses for not showing hospitality, of waiting until the supposedly ideal time comes along, waiting until perhaps the children are better behaved. It's not a fear some families have. How will the children behave when this visitor comes into the house? Or of waiting to perhaps things are a bit less hectic in our lives. Life can be hectic a lot of the time. This ideal time may never actually come along. So you may continue to evade this Christian ministry. Don't go away asking yourself, so, 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 do go away, do go away asking yourself this morning, how faithfully am I offering hospitality? 
How well is the duty of hospitality to others being fulfilled in my home? How well am I obeying this one another in the word of God? So far we've looked at the meaning of hospitality and the duty of hospitality. Now lastly, let me turn your thoughts to the motivation for hospitality. The motivation for hospitality. And this is of great relevance given the little phrase I haven't mentioned so far. At the end of 1 Peter 4 verse 9. Did you notice the phrase at the end of the verse? Look, look at the end of the verse. What's the phrase found there? That we're to offer this hospitality without grumbling or ungrudgingly. Without begrudging it. Without grumbling. The Greek word used here conveys a very wrong attitude that could spoil and impair our practicing of hospitality. For instance, this same Greek word is used in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, to describe how the Grecian Jews complained or grumbled against the Aramaic-speaking Jews. They're openly complaining and grumbling. Now, maybe you wouldn't necessarily openly grumble or complain so publicly, but the temptation to do so quietly and secretly might be a very real one. Otherwise, we wouldn't need to have this little phrase, would we? Include the end of verse 9. We're to offer hospitality without grumbling. Or the wrong approach could even manifest itself in terms of just being so hassled by all the tasks involved in offering hospitality that the whole joy is taken out of it. And you don't really ever want to do it very often. Because it just takes the whole joy. The hassle takes the joy out of it. Can't we see this happening even in a well-known episode during our Lord's ministry on earth? Remember the home of Martha and Mary? Now that was a home that was wonderfully welcoming to the Son of Man, who had often nowhere to lay down his head. But on one particular occasion, the Lord Jesus had a word of admonition for Martha. Luke chapter, in the Gospel of Luke we read, But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him, that is to Jesus, and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and will not be taken away from her. You see, Martha had allowed herself to get worried and upset by all the preparations involved in offering hospitality. And if we're not careful, we can just as easily get hassled and end up in the same place and even stop offering hospitality. We need to be our guard against that. And as has often been pointed out, and let me point out again today, it's very important for us to realise and be reminded that the practice of hospitality need not necessarily, it can, but it need not necessarily involve the making of an elaborate meal with all the time and the effort that might be involved in that. Obviously, if you make an elaborate meal, the person is likely to feel all the more welcome. But it can be very meaningful to someone just to invite them into your home for a cup of tea or coffee and a biscuit. After all, the aim shouldn't be, and again, there's a temptation here, to impress others by how well you can cook. No danger of that in my case. To impress others by how well you can cook. Or how splendor, splendid and cosy your house is. The aim should be to show that you care for the person. And that you're taking an interest in them. After all, our Lord Jesus himself didn't he point to the value of offering even a cup of cold water to one of his little ones. Even a cup of cold water was of value, says Jesus, and offered to one of his little ones. When we think about maintaining the right motivation when offering hospitality, a title of a book comes to mind that I came across some years ago, published by Day One Publications. The author was Derek Cleave. It had a very telling title that's always remained in my memory. Open Heart, Open Home. Open Heart, Open Home. Do you see the order there? The open heart and then the open home, they go together. It was aimed at getting across the important message that in opening our homes, we should also be opening up our hearts of love and care toward our guests. Ask the Lord to 
give you a big heart, to keep on opening your heart in this way, that should help you to avoid the sin of offering hospitality in a spirit of grumbling. It should indeed give you joy in offering such hospitality. Well, as we think about the motivation for hospitality, here are four things in closing. Four things that should help us to offer hospitality gladly. Four things. What are they? Well, the first one we find in the immediate context of 1 Peter 4 and verse 9. It's this. Always remember, always remember in using the home, and I phrase this carefully, in using the home which you live in, I'm not saying in using your home, in using the home which you live in to offer hospitality, you are being a faithful steward of God's grace to you. You are being a faithful steward of God's grace to you. You are faithfully administering God's grace in one of its forms, as the NIV puts it. You see, the offering of hospitality is one of the ways in which we can be good stewards of God's goodness toward us. It might be helpful for us to think of it in this way. In showing hospitality, I'm inviting people not into so much my home, but maybe my home legally and generally, but I'm inviting people not so much into my home, but into the home that the Lord has so generously given to me and to my family. That might help to counteract any tendency toward meanness which might smother our hospitality. We shouldn't view the homes we live in exclusively as personal possessions, but as gifts from a gracious God that we may use to help and minister to others. That's the first thing then. In using the home you live in, you're being a faithful steward of God's grace as you offer hospitality. Let that motivate you. Second thing that should motivate us to offer hospitality is the realization that in serving others in this way, we're actually thereby serving the Lord himself. We're actually thereby serving the Lord himself. Remember the famous parable that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 25. He commends his true and genuine disciples in this way when he says, I was a stranger and you invited me in. When they are puzzled by this and they ask the king, the Lord and king, when was it that they invited him in? The king gives them this answer. I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. In welcoming brothers in the Lord by offering them hospitality, in a certain sense, you're actually welcoming in the Lord himself. And may it not be the case that the king might ever have caused to say to you those awful words, I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. So in offering hospitality, we're serving the Lord himself. The third thing that should motivate us in offering hospitality is the blessing that it can bring to ourselves. Now, not to think of ourselves first and foremost, but the word of God does actually point this out. Remember that passage in Hebrews? It's encouraged them to show, to entertain strangers. Why? Because some who have done that have actually entertained angels unawares without knowing it and it's brought great blessing into their household. Probably the main example and view there was the case of Abraham and Sarah who, who welcomed and, uh, and turned out that there was an angel and what a blessing it was, what a blessing it was to that household. So while it would be, an, I think, a very exceptional thing indeed for the stranger whom you invite into your home to actually turn out to be an angel, I don't think that's the point of it. The point being made is that the Lord can use those guests to bring a blessing to you and to your household. Probably, some of you here today, you can think of cases, you can think of instances when you've had guests in your home and you've had cause to rejoice in the encouragement that they brought you through their visit, that you actually received from them far more than you gave to them in terms of food or whatever. If you're tempted to think of hospitality only in terms of hassle, and of course it can involve, realistically, quite a bit of time and effort, you should readjust your radar and expect blessing to come your way from the Lord as your guests minister in some way or another to you and to your household. I have heard of cases, I've heard of cases, more than one case, where children were really blessed spiritually by the presence of mature Christian family in their homes. 
who could testify to them about their experiences of God's grace and goodness. Of course, if you're a guest, seek to be a blessing. Seek to be a blessing. Be a good guest. Appreciate the hospitality being offered to you by the Lord's people and focus on deepening the bonds of fellowship as you meet together in that home. Fourthly, finally, surely we should be motivated to show hospitality to others when we appreciate how graciously welcoming the Lord God has been to us. How graciously welcoming the Lord God is to us. We who are once far away, outcasts and strangers before God, we have, and through the gospel of grace, been brought near to him. And we've been filled with all the goodness that his courts provide. Or as we'll be singing in Psalm 23, very shortly. You spread a table before all my foes. My head you've anointed. My cup overflows. Christian, today you've experienced the gracious, gracious generosity of the Lord toward you. Toward you. He's causing your cup to overflow. Having experienced such love Welcome from the perfect host. May your hearts, may our hearts, then overflow and spill over with love toward one another and toward the stranger as we offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Here's what God's word then says to us today. 1 Peter 4 verse 9. Do reflect upon it and keep applying it in your lives. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Amen. And as I said there toward the end of the sermon, we're going to sing now from Psalm number 23. It's the A version. Psalm 23 and the A version. The tune is Resignation number 295. As you, I'm sure, know, the imagery at the beginning of the psalm is certainly out of a shepherd caring well for his flock. Many commentators, however, point out that the imagery toward the end of the psalm seems to shift more to the imagery of a host looking after his guests. And there we have it in stanza three. How does this gracious host look after his guests? You spread me a table before all my foes, my head. You've anointed my cup overflows. And not only that, not only that, this gracious host brings us into his house, his people into his house forever. Your goodness and mercy will follow my days. And then I will dwell in the Lord's house. Always. Psalm 23a to the tune resignation. We stand to sing praise remain standing for the closing blessing.
to see the blessing of God. Now may the may be grace, mercy, and peace from the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and forevermore. Amen.